The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We're going to be talking about forgiveness and thoughts today. Um, I had a situation that happened when I first got saved. My late unsaved husband told me during the first year of our marriage, if you go get religious on me, I'll divorce you. Well, guess what? I got saved a few years later and there we go. But he was really, really angry at me. And so I was going through the grocery store one day and I heard this thought, your father rejected you. Your husband is rejecting you, and God rejects you. And I said, well, to myself, the first two may be true, but I know that God doesn't reject me. So in dealing with thoughts, we need to pay attention and not just accept anything that comes in our head. And there are really two different kinds of thoughts um, that can trouble us, and one is a distracting thought, one that just comes in like when I heard that voice in the grocery store, and the other type is a repetitive thought. We need to know how to deal with each one, whether it's a one-time occurrence or it's something we hear over and over again, and that's what we're going to be teaching on today. Jennifer mentioned two types of thoughts, the distraction and repetitive ones. Now, the distraction, that those can be intermittent, come in your day-to-day -day routine. The repetitive ones are, really need to be tested uh, more thoroughly because a repetitive thought means it's something that's playing over and over again like a, like a, a recording. Right. And you hear it intermittently over and over again from time to time, day-to-day, week-by-week. So w what we need to do is to test your thoughts. There's three... Uh, applications to test your thoughts and the first is uh, really tested by the Word of God after being a believer for a certain length of time you should know the scriptures enough to know whether a thought is even scriptural or not uh, and testing that it says do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they're of God first John 4 Verses one, so that means it, it needs to be tested. Not every voice you hear in your head needs to be tested. So that's our responsibility. The scripture gives us a responsibility. Absolutely, and uh, we test it by the word. All scriptures given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for uh, both doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second uh, Timothy three sixteen. Uh, test it by the Spirit. You know, God is love. Uh, even a corrective word should have the love nature of, of God behind it. Uh, I, I know, uh, give, just give you a simple example of uh, testing it by the spirit or the nature. Uh, you should know someone's voice. If, um, if uh, Pastor Vicki uh, called and, and said, Dennis, bring home milk and bread from Publix, uh, I would look at the phrase, bring home milk and bread. Well, that's okay. That sounds right, but that's not Jennifer. That wasn't her voice. That is the way we should be trained to learn the voice of the Spirit of God. We should know His nature to such a degree that it's not just the words that He said, but the Spirit. That, that's, that didn't feel like Jennifer. That felt like someone else regardless of the content. All right, so you test it by the Spirit. The Spirit will bear witness that it's God's Spirit and, and the voice will make you feel, if it makes you feel uncomfortable or questioning, like, I, I bring home milk and bread from the grocery store was okay, but there's something that didn't sit right, it didn't sound like her. Even in the movies, what do you see the, the bad guy does? He disguises his voice when he wants to ransom money. All right, we have to be, why do they disguise the voice? It's because you can recognize a person by the voice. Therefore, you should recognize the person of the Lord Jesus by his voice. That is probably why all Christians 
when it says his sheep know his voice, need to develop intimacy with God because it's only through intimacy in that relationship, heart to heart, spirit to spirit, breath to breath, that you really get acquainted with the nature behind it. The third test is the fruit. And sometimes this is an easy test. It's, okay, I just heard something in my head. Is that God or is that, was that just my flesh? Say, well, if you did it, and you followed through with it, what would the fruit look like? For example, what would the fruit be if I really felt like this is true and God has rejected me? It would cut off my relationship with Him. Sure. It would bear bad fruit, and a tree is known by its fruit, so it, we were to be fruit testers, <laughs> uh, so to speak. But those three, uh, really, tested by the Word, tested by the Spirit, and then tested by the ultimate fruit. What would it produce if I followed through on that statement? In that case of uh, uh, Pastor Vicky telling me to get bread and milk, I would bring bread and milk. The fruit would be, you'd go, I didn't tell you to bring milk and bread home. How'd what you are you doing it? with this? <laughs> okay. Well, you didn't, wasn't that you? See, we've got to get more acclimated to the voice, the nature behind the words. Now, um, we've been talking in the past about how to use the blue card. And it's, it actually has prayer steps. You can read this card to someone and walk them through healings. And so I'm going to review now what we've talked previously about how to deal with toxic emotions. And by the way, there is an interaction between emotions and thoughts that's very important. First of all, we have to remember that everything is easy for Jesus. We've heard a lot recently about people who say they've had a trauma, but it doesn't matter if you had a big trauma happen or a little hurt or a little fear, it's the same for Jesus. Big and little is something that we assess something as, but big and little is irrelevant as far as Jesus. We're the ones with the big and little. Everything is easy for Jesus. So on the blue card, to deal with emotions, we start off with three steps. And by the way, every time, everything you deal with in life about emotions usually just requires the first three steps on the blue card First, feel, forgive. Now, what do we mean by that? You First of all, we make a connection with God when we are in an attitude of prayer. So we start off by telling people to close your eyes and focus on Jesus in your heart. Now, if we want to deal with emotions, we say, what's the first thing or situ first person or situation that comes to mind? And we just trust, it will just pop in. We don't have to go digging around. The Lord, we do hear his voice. He speaks to us and he's very gracious. And we're asking him to show us anything that he needs to touch in our hearts. So first, and then allow yourself to feel any negative feeling that is there. Let's go back to the situation when I heard the voice in the grocery store say, God rejects you. If I had not immediately renounced it and gave into it, I might have actually felt some rejection in my heart. Well, I didn't do that, but if I had, and that's what came to mind, and I felt the hurt, I would let Jesus in my heart go to that and through it and wash it out. And what Jesus does when he was, washes out something toxic, he instantly replaces it with the peace of God, the peace, the presence of God. Now, this is where all the activity takes place. This is what, when Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living, jo living water, John 7, 38, in the Greek, he doesn't use the Greek word cardia, which means heart. He uses the Greek word quelia, which literally means belly. So Jesus is indicating that this is the epicenter of our spiritual 
and our emotional life. And then other verses in the Bible talk about bowels of compassion and so forth, indicating this area. It doesn't mean that your spirit is in an actual physical organ. It just means that this is the epicenter. Okay, so right now I'm going to pray you through an emotional healing. We're asking the Lord to show you something that you need to take care of in your heart through going to Jesus. So I'll just read right off this card. Close your eyes and pray. Yield to Jesus in your heart. When we close our eyes, we almost automatically get in an attitude of prayer. First, focus on the first person or situation that comes to mind. Even if you don't understand why it came to mind or what it's about at first, just pay attention to it. As Dennis said, we're his sheep. We do hear his voice. Now focus on what you saw, person or situation, and feel the feeling in your belly, in your gut. It doesn't matter if you can't say what it is, if it's uncomfortable or just yucky or whatever. You know it's not the presence of Jesus. Now, let Jesus go to that feeling and, the, and then through it and let a river of forgiveness flow out until it changes to peace. So those are the first three prayer steps that we need to, where we need to go to take care of issues in our heart. And that's the vast majority of them. Uh, it's to deal with emotion should be as easy as breathing. I'd like to bring something up. When Jennifer mentioned it's neither big nor little, uh, remember when the man was uh, brought down by his friends, the paralytic, through the roof, Jesus said, and the Pharisees had a problem with him saying, your sins are forgiven, more than the healing. They were more interested that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, than the fact that he was healed physically, mainly because only God can forgive sin. So when we're telling you to forgive, realize that it's the new creation you that has to forgive. That's why the Bible says, Matthew 18, from the heart. But again, big and little does not exist. We need to emphasize that. It's been in the last uh, number of years, I've noticed a shift in the church with the use of the word trauma. Right. For 40 some years, I've ministered effectively to big and little issues and just used the word fear. We have to be careful that we don't make big and little. Obviously, there's traumas. You get in a bad car accident, you can be traumatized to where you don't want to drive again and stuff. But again, dealing with fear. It's fear. Uh, calling it trauma could, even though it's valid, it could mistakenly make you think it's bigger, it's too big for God even. Or it's going to take a long or time. Or it's going to take a long time. Uh, big and little does not exist on God's end. Big and little exists on ours. And our mind has the capacity to make a mountain or a molehill out of it. We do have that capacity. So my encouragement is, is uh, to speak to that mountain <laughs> if it's big and it seems so big and insurmountable because God, it's not. And it's God who is at work in you both to will and to perform. It's not about you tackling the mountain in the flesh because then it would be insurmountable But because apart from him, you can do nothing. But uh, negative emotions are, aren't the only problem that we have. How many of you have thoughts that bother you? And you've been told, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it was very interesting when we discovered that I knew they meant mindset and that the renewing of the mind required mind, will, and emotions, the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S. And, and that perfect love would cast out that fear so we could renew our mind, but in the process of renewing your mind, it requires dealing with the thought, the emotion, and the will. Actually, in Vine's Expository Dictionary, it defines N-O-U-S, mind, 
as your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. So repentance, forgiveness, everything requires all three. That's your soulish nature. All three need to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. And we've seen people basically say the same. Uh, they can, they're real good at confessing the right scriptural answer. But if all three are not engaged, you could just be giving mental assent to something and then making it hard, big or little. You can make it form a theology that it must be difficult. I must have to work on this. I must have to say this over and over again for weeks or months because it's a big thing. When, again, we've seen instant radical change when the people let the God inside work with them and through them. Now, uh, how many, how many uh, recognize that perfect love casts out fear? We'd all say, well, perfect love casts. But I've seen people go like this, oh, perfect love casts out fear, oh, perfect love. You know, eventually you might get it right, but the fear is not the anointing. And so you, you, you can't just deal with thoughts all by themselves. Uh, the, the, you need to ask yourself, is there a better or faster way to deal with the thoughts? And there is. Uh, the key is always start with the emotion. You know, uh, I was uh, trained life and death are in the power of the tongue. And then you would say, well, what do you mean by that? And people say, your words. Yes but you're missing the key ingredient, the power of the words, the power behind the words. This is why, again, mind, will, and emotions. If you've got fear behind Scripture... There's no anointing. No. Uh, the name of Jesus doesn't work in the flesh. And confessing the word in the flesh isn't going to work. It needs to be coming... It can eventually, because you eventually if get in. accidentally do it right one time. <laughs> exactly. But then you form a theology that it must be hard. And, and the church has been notorious historically with making it hard. I was even taught when I took Christian counseling courses that forgiveness is a long, difficult process. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's instant, the same as it was when you were born again. It was you did, that it, fast. It, it, it was because Jesus is doing the work Yes, you cooperate when you received him and you said, cleanse me of my sin and I'll live for you and serve you all the days of my life. If you prayed that prayer, there should have been the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit or peace with God. Peace is the internal indication that a transaction took place or that there was a supernatural exchange. If we're going to start seeing some of these thoughts coming down and, and uh, being dealt with, we have to first of all understand that if you do not deal with the emotion behind it, success is going to be very limited and it's going to be repetitious. The early church had difficulty uh, hundreds of years ago. They made salvation hard. We have this innate capacity to make something harder than it is. Then, the turn of the century, uh, people were being filled with the Holy Spirit, it was being restored gloriously to the church, and what? People were tearing for 10 years, waiting, well, if God wants me to have it, it'll have it, you know. They, we, can, we have that capacity to make it harder, and so is forgiveness and repentance. It is not something that is difficult. It is something that hasn't been done properly, and when you can be sincerely wrong, you can give in to mental assent, say all the right answers. You know, that was the beauty of learning to discern the human spirit. As I let Jesus discern me, I got more acclimated to discern Him and what was going on in me. And you need to know what's going on in you. You are responsible for you. And then after you discern what's going on in you, you can even discern what's going on in someone else. And I, I found a lot of people were saying the right answers, but the source was faulty. It was fleshly. There was no unction on it, no authority. And uh, <clears throat> so these are some of the things that people might hear. And again, if you really understand the importance of the emotions behind the thought, you're going to see much more success. Tell them the one about playing golf. Uh, yeah, it, it's like I've never had any interest in golf. I went with a bunch of pastors one time, and I thought it was boring. Okay? Uh, but I love Jennifer. Now, if I heard in my head, Dennis, you're a bad golfer, 
there, there, there was no power behind it. Because you don't care. I, I don't care, <laughs> you know. That would be an easy one to dismiss. But they said, Dennis, you've been mean to Jennifer. That, that might hurt and be a legit, what did I do? As a matter of fact, Jennifer had a way of not, I had to teach Jennifer to yell at me when we were first married. Not yell, but she would, if, she, if I hurt her feelings and I didn't know about it, she wouldn't say nothing. I would just go off quietly and forgive. Yeah, and I'd say, but that's not a relationship. A relationship is you gotta say, hey, that hurt my feelings. And, and, and make it to where there's some kind of a level of communication going on. But the key is, if you wanna memorize something that would be very helpful, every thought, this is the way I learned it as a baby Christian, and I was seeing success in ministering emotional healing. It was as easy as breathing when other people were saying, you gotta go for counseling, you gotta take this course, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, and there's all kinds of techniques out there, and trust me, if it's helping people, fine. But I found that in the simplicity of Jesus, the greatest thing was to know that every thought has a corresponding emotion. I don't care if you're not a touchy-feely person. Every, you're, you're wired that way by God. And they're even stored that way in mm -hmm. long-term memory as feeling thoughts. If you want to uh, uh, remember something that happened years ago and it comes to mind, the feeling will come with the thought from years ago. That's actually a technique that actors and actresses use. They, if they need to cry, they will recall a painful thought, painful thought, mm -hmm. emotion and thought. But we want to see you set free from some of the repetitive thoughts that we right, talked about right, earlier. Right. And, and, but the significance of understanding the emotional power behind it is what important. What are some thoughts that we hear a lot? I'm a failure. Oh, 45 years in ministry and I think I've heard that one over and over again. It's contrary to the Word of God. It's a false personality. It, God didn't say, hmm, uh, say I'm going to make a bunch of people here and I'm going to make some failures too. A lot of them. You know, we really need that to balance out life or, or for, the, for the bell curve. What are some of the other thoughts we... <laughs> I can't do anything right. No uh, one pays attention to me. I'm unworthy. Oh, I never the, belong. You hear the violin. I can hear the violin play now. I'm, I'm unworthy. I never belong. I'm damaged goods. Um, yeah. Or it's, it's too, too late, late for, for me. me now. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know, so, which is not scripture, right? No. <laughs> okay. Change is transformation, and God wants you to go from faith to faith, glory to glory, victory to victory. That's the way transformation is supposed to take place. But all thoughts have a corresponding emotion. The scientists know that this is true. Uh, they go into long-term memory as a single unit. They're, they're, they're hooked together, and... They're there until, what does forgiveness do with the toxic emotion? It washes out the toxic emotion. Well, what the, well, we have these emotions, what does God do? Replace it with something? Yes, he replaces it with supernatural peace. He himself is our peace. He gave us the gifts of his so peace. So you could we call those saved. the fruit of the spirit, God emotions. So here is, here is a previously um, toxic, thought, feeling combination here. Mm -hmm. And before, when you would think about it, you would feel the negative feeling. Mm -hmm. With forgiveness, and it changes to peace, you can bring that same thought back into your conscious mind and think of it, and there'll be peace attached. So that's how transformation occurs. And oh, this is the really great part, because every time Jesus does this and puts his peace where there was pain, it increases your anointing. So, for example, I had a lot of fear issues. Once I dealt with them where there was once a lot of fear, there was a lot of anointing. And that means that I have an anointing in that area to help others. Mm -hmm. So I love that. It's like kicking the devil in the teeth. What right. he meant for harm, now Jesus uses for good. Jennifer uh, initially <laughs> had difficulty talking, public speaking. Oh, yes. She dealt with that fear and 
<laughs> Look at this. She's up here with me. She's not going to let me do all the talking. She's been talking ever since. That's healthy. So there is actually, on the other side of some of your attacks, your emotional attacks and woundings, is an anointing that could help you fulfill your personal destiny. Tell about your biggest uh, wounding as a child and what God's doing with it now. Well, the biggest one was rejection. And uh, it was so interesting uh, that I saw that if you forgive, even people, perhaps they should have given you what you needed and they didn't. That's not the issue. The issue of forgiveness is freedom for you. It's not about changing the other person. And when you forgive those that have rejected you and you begin to bless them, your heart changes and you see that they are the victim, so not that, you. And when you say, God, if I had a need for acceptance or attention or approval, if I had that need, and that's a legitimate need, everybody, that's a legitimate need. If I had a legitimate need for that, then I'm going to receive that need to be met righteously by God himself. So what happened in your own life? He basically... You no, know I mean with your father. Oh, the, the day came when Who, after he rejected, he rejected me. His, my grandfather rejected him. And it, I was born, I was invisible, just like he was invisible because he was illegitimate. And my grandfather could never deal with the shame. So it was like my dad really wasn't there. When I was born, that was generational. When I was born, my dad never knew acceptance. And he did the same thing to me. But then I, I became a Christian and I realized that I just released forgiveness. He couldn't give me something he never got. And as I released forgiveness to him, God said, I'm giving you my undivided attention. You're the apple. I started receiving all that I needed and didn't receive from him. I started receiving directly from God. I began to receive righteously what God has for every one of us. And that was approval. And the beautiful part of that is later on, I was uh, uh, a young pastor and I had an altar call for men that really never heard that approval, never really had a, a, a positive word that came through a male voice. And I looked up and here my dad answered the altar call and tears were flowing down his face that he had never heard an affirming word through a male voice and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he just wept like a baby. So I saw this is a spiritual solution. Uh, nothing, how many people uh, live their whole life overcompensating, trying to give somebody something that they need, when in reality they don't have it themselves? And, you know, you can feel like, but I need to do this, and I need to do it. But you're not God. God can meet all legitimate needs for love, peace, acceptance, uh, he can meet that legitimate need through him, but the prerequisite is that you forgive and let a river of forgiveness flow out to everyone who didn't give it to you. Because otherwise, that judgment remains and a, a, a bitter root gets established. And a, and a bitter root, we're not going to get into that too much, but a bitter root is, is something that you forget about in many cases. You could forget about the judgment you made on your father. You, but the, it doesn't die. It gets buried alive. And it will resurface again and again as rejection. Oh, then my boss rejects me. This, uh, I change and jobs. And you will have a repetitive thought that you hear over and over again. <clears throat> so... Right. There is a fourth step on the blue card that specifically deals with thoughts. And this says, occasionally a lie may be believed at the time of emotional wounding and become a mental stronghold. Always start with the emotion, forgive first, and then you have spiritual authority to renounce the lie because you have peace. Mm -hmm. Again, what did I ask you to memorize? Every thought has a corresponding emotion because we're, 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 we're word-oriented 
believers and we're thought-oriented people, but we have to understand the way we're wired or that because that's just not enough. You can give a lot of mental assent, meaning I am sincerely agreeing with the words. But uh, even, even in the scripture it says, with their lips they praise me, but their heart is somewhere else. You can give lip service to something and the heart not be right. That's the key. And in order to understand that, we have what we call the blue card. And it's not complicated, although we did do a class once. And we did this particularly to help people with for themselves and praying with other people. And it's based not on a method or something we came up with. It's based on how I have sat in with Dennis through thousands of um, sessions. And it's based on how I observed the Holy Spirit deal right. with people, the order the Holy Spirit tended to go in. So, Which is an encounter. That's reality, you and Jesus. An encounter and then the subsequent process that the Holy Spirit works you through. That is not a method. No. It's, 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 it's like a walk in the Spirit is not a method. It's a moment-by-moment -moment relationship of sensitivity. And actually, that's what we need cultivated. Uh, uh, Word-oriented people need to, need to be a little bit more aware of the intimacy with that word, not just knowing it in your head. You're going to have to know it from the heart. Um, Should I talk a little bit about uh, the emotions and molecules of emotion and all that now? Yeah. Well, back... In 1999, two significant scientific books were published. One was on the molecules of emotion. Emotions hadn't really been studied. Um, we could actually say, based on these two um, books, that science, it marked the beginning of science catching up with the Bible. Now, emotions are caused by neuropeptides, tiny molecules in the body, and they interact with the surface of every cell. Every cell in your body has receptors on it, and when molecules of emotion cascade throughout the entire body, when they touch the cell, there are receptors that, that, that can receive that molecule and draw it into the inside of the cell. Now, Hopefully, we want mostly happy emotions, what we would call positive emotions, because that actually speaks health to our physical body. Mm -hmm. And the opposite happens, too, that our negative emotions, especially if we keep them all stored inside us, they can be the cause of physical disease. So we really can say that um, as far as emotions, first of all, you're biography, the story of your life becomes your biology, and next, that childhood negative emotions, if we leave them stored, can lead to adulthood diseases. Mm -hmm. But we also are learning now how Jesus can wash those out so we don't have to tolerate them being stuck in our hearts. Now, your emotions are processed very, very quickly. If you have a thought, now that has to go through um, your past memory, your experiences. It has to go through a lot of different areas of your brain. But emotions are processed pretty much instantly. Now, say we're in this room, and all of a sudden there's a loud noise. Something fell over. You are going to react physiologically before you can even form a thought, you jump and then say, oh, oh, a chair was knocked over or something like that. But these molecules of emotion impact you. People, their, their faces blush when they get embarrassed, their faces flush and so forth. So um, there's even an interesting psychological studies where they talk about the emotions and the physiological parts of your body that are affected by them. It's kind of interesting. It doesn't have anything to do with spirituality. It's just a matter of us reading emotions physically. Yeah, 
But there's a term that you came across in your research that I think is important. And it, it explained to Jennifer why I was getting so much success <laughs> uh, ministering with people and teaching them how to deal with their emotional pain. Emo cognition, emo volition, a rather recent Right. Study. And another book that, that was published in 1999 actually explained how we're, our emotions and thoughts are wired together physiologically. And it was discovered that we have as many neurons in our gut, around our stomach, our esophagus, that we have in part of our neurological system that we know as our nervous system, the brain, the peripheral nerves, our spinal cord, in the process of embryonic development, there is a clump of future nerve tissue called the neural crest. At about three weeks of embryonic development, that neural crest separates and the potential nerve cells, future nerve cells, migrate and of course form what uh, the long-known nervous system part of us, but then the rest migrates to the gut, and that has a name now, the enteric nervous system. So what it ends up being is we have a thinking brain up here that processes our thoughts, but we have an emotional brain down here that processes our emotions. This is kind now, of like when you say a fireman or a military soldier in a certain situation, a policeman in a, a lot of times his head has a certain amount of information, but he gets this gut hunch. Right. That literally right. means his emotional brain is picking up something. Right, and remember, emotions are faster than thoughts. So, now with this emotional brain and your thinking brain are connected by the left vagus nerve. And it goes, there is an emotional center in your brain that has to do with your emotions, but this is the epicenter. And the truth is your brain, your thinking brain, does not inform your gut. Your emotional brain tells your thinking brain what you feel. So it really makes sense now when you read the scriptures about out of your belly and, and the door of your heart, you see, all thoughts and choices have emotions. We have feeling thoughts and we have feeling choices. If you don't want something, your heart's not going to be open to it. But Jesus said that I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens to me, I will come in. Well, we know Jesus doesn't stand at our head and knock, but he does stand at the door of our heart and we can open to him. And that's what happened when we got saved, whether we knew what was happening or not. And actually, we talk about the feeling thought loop. When we opened our heart to Jesus, all of a sudden, he got in the loop. And we could feel the peace of his presence. We could feel the love of his heart we could feel the fruit of the Spirit for the first time when we got saved. We can open our heart to God's love and His love can touch all the cells of our body. What do you think was happening to Moses when he had been in the presence of God and it had changed him physically so much that when he came down the mountain, his skin was shining from His love and His glory? I think... We're being changed we're every being, time we're in the presence of God. That's right. But I want to encourage believers to be in the presence of God more effectively. You can be kind of there like being rained on, or you can be there and participating. It can be on the outside or the inside. Uh, the key is, what, what about if, if we need mind, will, and emotions, emo cognition, emo volition, to be all three, to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then... What about these people that say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm a head person, and they're actually proud of it. Uh, I'm a head person, and I'm glad I learned to be a spirit person. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what about people who say, I don't have any feelings? What are they, what are they really, 
what are they saying? That their heart's pretty closed off. They've, they've suppressed their emotions. But you know what feelings always come out? Angry feelings. Those don't get they're, stay stuffed. They're buried alive. Even children who are autistic and really can't make an emotional connection with other people, they can certainly connect with anger. Yeah, if, if emotions don't die, they're buried alive because they're stored as feeling thoughts. Then anything negative that's not dealt with, uh, I think people try to protect themselves by suppressing those negative feelings. And if I don't acknowledge them, they'll go away. No, what they will do is at a certain moment, under certain stimulation, they will express themselves without your permission. And they when will you don't want them to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you might think you're in, under control, all right? And, and men, men will like to say that they don't have emotions. We dealt with so many men. <laughs> but but they, we deal with the word stress. Oh, tell about the time we were asked to come to a certain church up in New England and they asked me to teach on emotions to the ladies and they asked Dennis to teach on stress to the men and we taught exactly the same, same things. Thing. <laughs> See, stress by definition means you are being emotionally controlled by people or circumstances. That's right, emotionally controlled by people or circumstances. That's what produces stress. and. Sometimes it's even being controlled by just self-will. That, that uh, we talked about the pitfalls of that independent self that wants to operate apart from God and do what it thinks is right. That's called your flesh. Yes. And the flesh <laughs> reaps flesh, more <laughs> flesh. What we're trying to see is that if you could understand every thought has a corresponding emotion, then you're going to learn to submit to the Lordship of Jesus, mind, will, and emotions. But we pray with people who say, well, I don't feel anything. I can see my mother was, uh, m was murdered before my eyes, but I don't feel nothing. How would you minister to them effectively? I know what they did. They had a, a traumatic event. And again, don't overuse that word trauma because you, it's getting so... That, in that case, it would be traumatic. In that case, it was traumatic. But what we're doing is I see the church leaning toward that word to where everybody's got a little owie, a little emotional pain, is using the word trauma now. Fear is the wrong kingdom. So let's just deal with it. Bigger, little, Jesus so is sufficient. So she was afraid to feel. So you had to, you had said, to deal as with an, the fear before she could... Right. So I would just say, as an act of my will, because I can't will for her. You can't do it to her, although we have a lot of ministers that think they're doing something to somebody, when in reality, without their cooperation, not much happens. All right? But <clears throat> if you say, as an act of my will, and once they know that their will is here, down in the gut. That's where you open and shut. Yeah, you yield it. Even if you just open the door a crack, okay, and you just feel it a little bit, that's enough to present it to Jesus. You don't have to go into some kind of emotional meltdown. meltdown. Right. That's usually for the people that are trying to control it and think that, well, i got to let it out every now and then. That's as dumb as punching a pillow to get rid of your anger. No, that's only going to fortify it. You're actually training yourself <laughs> to be a better pillow fighter. But, you know, it's interesting. Even in the secular world, uh, whether they, they know it's the will or not, uh, on, they have those little uh, camp uh, in the wilderness and they try to have team building for businesses. Oh, and what's their corporate retreats. Corporate retreats. Mm -hmm. well, what's the first thing they like to do? They say, we're going to develop trust. And they will stand behind somebody and say, fall backwards. You have to trust that they're there to catch you. Falling backwards is unnatural to the will. Nobody wants to fall backwards. You have to actually release your will. And for you believers, you need to get a little more spiritually sensitive. When you yield the will, whether you fall backwards or not, it's not the point. But when you yield the will, and you even fall backwards a little bit, stand against the wall if you want to try this, and, <laughs> and six inches from the wall, as you yield down here, the door of the heart 
I can't believe how many people don't know where their heart is and don't know the door. The door is the will. And when you yield the will, uh, there's a beautiful experience. You'll find, this is for especially men who stress. Stress means you're white knuckling it with people and circumstances and you're trying harder. You will eventually get worn out. And right now, I think in the season that we're in in the church, I think the enemy's trying to wear out the saints of the Most High God, get you busy doing something until you wore out. But if you would yield the will, peace increases proportionally to your yielding. So you could just say, let's you know what? Him, let's have, um, let's have him let's yield. Let's just, just do this. Just do it right, right where you're at. It's just like worshiping without words. I'm going to yield and open the door of my heart to my Jesus. And you will feel peace increase even without words. Let's give him a minute. To... Remember, we feel the emotion faster than we get a thought. Mm -hmm. So pay attention. There's a change in this room. And, you know, yeah, a change right in the room where we're at. And it's like, Worshiping without words, you can actually sense the presence of God. Now, words will add a dimension to it of specificity and power and authority and release. But the, it has to come from the proper source. It, the grace of yielding is almost a lost art. But we should, be, we should live by dying and fight by the yielding. The grace of yielding, it has a nice sound to it. Mm -hmm. That's where everything spiritual starts, is with that. By grace. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do. Wouldn't you rather that it was him that did the work? Now, when I say God is at work in you to will and to perform, that's not independent of you. It's not like you sit back and go, okay, <laughs> God, you forgive them. I tell you, I can't. But on the other hand, if from the new creation reality, who's doing the forgiving is actually you and the Spirit of God, grace. Grace is the God who is at work in you to both will and to perform. Now, yes, he's performing, but he's not going to do this without your cooperation. If you don't forgive, he's not going to forgive you. So the you that's doing the forgiving is both you and the Spirit of grace, the empowerment of that's God. the new creation you. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit well, with him. So it's you and Jesus. That kind of explains then, apart from him, you can do nothing. And then the scripture says, and you can do all things through him. There you go. Independent of him, you can't do anything. Which is flesh. With flesh. Flesh doesn't produce anything. But with him and in him and through him. So then... Uh, Meditate on this a little bit. Coming from the place of forgiveness as the new creation, if it's Galatians 2.20 said, it is no longer I who live, but, but Messiah. Messiah Jesus in me who lives. And this life that I live in the flesh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. So it is no longer I who live, because we're living through him now. Mm -hmm. that, that suggests it's no longer I who love. Is that scriptural? Your human love doesn't mean anything. It's nice, but it doesn't do anything. It is we love because he first loved us. So when we love, we love with God's love. Apart from him, you can do nothing. So it's no longer I who live. It's no longer I who love. Then it, that also suggests it's no longer I who forgives but it's Jesus the forgiver in me as I cooperate with it that that forgiveness flows like a river. So we're dealing with our emotions and with our thoughts in like co-laboring with Jesus. We're with Jesus. Now, can you see why we have to start with the emotions and get in the anointing, get in the peace of God, the supernatural peace of God, and then the thought. We had the two kinds of troubling thoughts we mentioned, the distractions mm -hmm. and those repetitive thoughts. I bet when we were going through that list that some of the people watching had a troubling thought that they deal with 
from time to time. I bet some of you heard that thought that you hear over and over again. Remember, if it's a distraction, all you have to do is renounce it. Just don't take it in. But if it is repetitive, we want to teach you how to go to Jesus in you and get free from that. And we're going to use the blue card again. So let's pray it through. Dennis, let's you and I pray with them. Okay, go ahead. So the first step is close your eyes and pray. Now we're starting out here with you maybe already having the thought, most emotional healing, just take the first for, feel forgive steps, but you may not even know that there's a thought at the time, but if that's the case, then after you forgive, you would hear the thought, but you probably already have it. So close your eyes and pray. We want to go to where that voice, where that thought got started. First person or situation that comes to mind. What do you feel in your gut? Feel the feeling in your gut. And forgiveness can go in three ways. Usually with a thought, it's forgiving somebody else, something they said. But it could be receiving forgiveness because you could have thought something bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. So let forgiveness go to that feeling and through that feeling like a river of forgiveness flowing. Let it flow out if it's to somebody else and receive forgiveness if it's toward you. Just like when you got saved, you received forgiveness. And when now you, the thought. Now the thought. And when you receive forgiveness at salvation, there was evidence of an assurance or an, a supernatural exchange. The test before you move forward and deal with the thought is, am I at the place of peace? Did I have this, the toxic emotion out of the way? Because right. peace has to do with the authority or the rule. Let the peace of God rule. When he's ruling, you're in the anointing. Right, and a place of power. So... You got a thought, now right where you are, you can whisper if you want, I want you to renounce that thought out loud. I renounce that thought that I'm a failure, um, I'm unworthy, whatever, I renounce that thought. Now you just cast down a mental stronghold. Now go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, God, Lord, what do you say? What's the truth? Mm -hmm. And you will instantly hear a scripture or a thought that's scriptural. And when we're doing with this, this with people, a lot of times as soon as they hear what God says, they get a smile on their faces. Lord, what do you say about me? Now, what do you do then? You receive it. The Bible talks about the engrafted word, the implanted word. Writing it on a tablet receive of my heart. Receive it and let God write it on your heart. And you will own it. Right. You will definitely own it by the power of the Spirit. And there's a nice anointing mm. now. So. And it could become a spiritual strength rather than a point of weakness right. or attack. Right. Now here's two things to remember about a government of voice. And that is, remember, every communication has two lines. One is the authority or what's behind it. The other is the content. And I watch people, uh, when we talked about testing the word, sure, you test it by the content, whether it's scriptural or not. But there's a lot of things that the content <clears throat> needs to be understood in the context of the authority behind it. Like I said. Like the emotion behind it. What like is, a, a bad feeling behind it. If there's a bad feeling behind it, that's not the anointing. And that's not the authority of God. And I can discern, like we said before, my sheep know my voice. So they would know if I called uh, uh, someone in the church up and said, uh, hi, this is Jennifer. They go, 
That's well, the there's wrong nothing voice. wrong with the hi, this was Jennifer. There's nothing wrong with the statement. But it's the wrong voice. But it's the wrong voice. They're going, nah, that's not <laughs> Jennifer. I know Jennifer. That is the way we're supposed to be approaching that relationship with Jesus. To where, no, that's not, <clears throat> that's not my Jesus' voice. So this is kind of like the thing, Dennis, you're a bad golfer. Yeah. That if there's, if it doesn't matter to you, if there's no, there's no power. pain or something toxic that it, trigger, it triggers in you, then you don't have to pay any attention to the voice. Right. There's a whole lot of things you hear in your head. You can't stop thoughts from going through your head. Yeah, the old saying, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you don't have to let it make a nest in your <laughs> that, hair. That's right. You can dismiss a lot of the thoughts because they don't have any power. Like, nah. Eh, eh, no big deal. Move on. <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> But if it has made a nest, <coughs> then you can deal with the emotion behind it and it has nothing to hang on to anymore. And as you develop in sensitivity to God, and when we, we're talking emotion, emotion, emotion. Well, I, I don't believe in all that emotion stuff. You, man, you can't live by feelings. Uh, you can't live without them either. What they're saying, and the church has taught this for years, you can't live by your carnal emotions, and but that's you, an absolute. But you are supposed to live by the fruit of the Spirit. The and, God emotions. And the enemy can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. In Ephesians, it says that we're to walk in shoes of peace. That means in our daily life, when we stay in peace, we're wearing spiritually ar spiritual armor, and the enemy can't get his darts to us. We've minimized peace. We think that that's some kind of a passive salutation at best. Uh, peace meaning absence of conflict. I want to tell you something. The God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. It's a reality. I once had worked in a halfway house where uh, uh, an, an inmate didn't take his medication and threatened me with a knife. He said he was going to cut you to pieces. He's going to cut me to pieces. Now, I don't know about you, but those words didn't have a nice feeling behind it. But God in me had a peace that increased. He told me, get out of the way. And, as and God was saying, God don't get was out saying, of the don't way. get out of the way. So the God of peace can crush the enemy. But I don't recommend you guess with that one, though. You would have to know, know for sure. You would have to know for sure that the peace of God far exceeded anything. And so what happened? Because the peace ended up affecting him. He dropped the knife. Fell to his knees, started crying. And they gave him his medicine. Right, so, right. Uh, but that's, that reminds me of the story about Charles Finney, the, the revivalist, who would walk in a factory and people, and people would, would begin to fall to their knees and weep <clears throat> that the presence of God is the best evangelist. Yeah. And they would say, what must we do to be saved? Now. So that was like presence evangelism. Right, right. So don't minimize that intimate relationship with God and creating that kind of a relationship to where presence is his authority. Let the peace of God rule. You know, it's not just about Jesus being your savior. It's about being Lord. And one of the ways to learn how to make Jesus Lord is to let the peace of God rule. Let it be a challenge. It says he himself is our peace. So his peace is an indication that his presence is right there with you. So now I want you to remember you don't have to put up with tormenting thoughts anymore. This really works. You know what to do with them. You take them to Jesus so they stop bothering you. You want God's truth, God's facts. You don't want the enemy speaking lies to you and you just giving and taking whatever he says in. And remember, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Don't make a, uh, don't make even a molehill insurmountable. Right, right. You can diffuse negative thoughts and negative emotions with forgiveness and peace and you can let the peace of God rule in everyday life. Amen. amen, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information,
information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.